Good morning, it's nice to be here. It's very exciting to be at Rapid 2019 and to be the keynote speaker on Wednesday morning. I really wanna say that the innovations that were just uh, presented to us by Michael and Melanie were very interesting. It's exciting to see new innovations around additive technology come out every day. And uh, I just wish them both the uh, best of luck when we find out from the polls who wins. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about uh, Stryker and our journey through additive manufacturing and how we've used the technology uh, to, for some of our implant components. Stryker is really excited about additive technology. We're excited about technology in general. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, all of you know about Stryker, so I'm going to spend a few minutes and I'm going to introduce the company to you. I'm sure there are some of you very familiar with uh, our company in the audience, but I'll spend that, that time. And then I'll talk, up, talk about our history with additive manufacturing, where we started, where we've been, and where, we're, where we are with the technology. And I also am going to bring in some of our other technologies that we use alongside additive manufacturing to really make healthcare better and really do innovative things with uh, components and with, uh, with additive. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about some of the product features that we have as well. So let's start with our company. Stryker's mission is, together with our customers, we are driven to make healthcare better. That is at the heart of everything we do. All the cool technology we look at, all of the implant designs that we look at, all of the components that we make around healthcare, it's all about working with our customers to make healthcare better. We have a very strong sense of, of values within the company, which are, are up on the screen, the integrity, accountability, people, and performance. It is so much about those values within our company. It is, it is within our DNA and within our culture. Our company strategy ties in really nicely with our mission. Our mission defines why we do what we do. And our values define what we believe. And our company strategy works together with those to say where we're going. And also for our customers to answer the question, why Striker and why work with us? Our company strategy is to drive market leading growth and achieve category leadership in med surge equipment, orthopedics, and neurosurgical technology and spine. Four pillars of that uh, mission and strategy is customer focus, innovation, globalization, and cost transformation. Now, if you think about what this conference is about, 3D printing and additive manufacturing, I can see many ways in which additive manufacturing fits within our company strategy. And if you listen to what our, our CEO, Kevin Lobo, says, he can see many ways that additive manufacturing fits within our company strategy. <clears throat> Just quickly at a glance, a few things about Stryker. Um, we're $13.6 billion in sales in, in 2018, which is great. It's been wonderful at the company to see the growth of the company. Um, we are also focused on patenting technology that we look at. Uh, so we have over 7,700 patents. Uh, we're part of the S&P 500. Uh, and, and it is a global company across the world. Uh, so we have a near, about 36,000 employees globally for Stryker. One of the most interesting things for me is how we began. So this is a picture of Dr. Homer Stryker. Uh, Dr. Homer Stryker was a, a physician in Kalamazoo, Michigan, so not too far away from here. And when he was a med student, uh, he often found that things didn't exactly work the way he wanted them to work. And he had a motto or, 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 uh, or, or, or uh, a way he thought. That, and what he always thought was, if you can't make your, so if you have a tool that doesn't work, make it work. If you can't make it work, make a new one. Make something that does work. And we, Homer Stryker would find himself in the basement of the, of the hospitals as he was a med student and as he was uh, a, a doctor, working on new components and new things really to make his patients' lives better. Um, a couple of the, the key, key things that he invented are, are some um, innovations in hospital beds for patients who had to stay in beds and couldn't move around to help relieve sores uh, on, on the patient's body. And then one of my favorite is, uh, is, is the, the cast removal, the, the cutter, the cast cutter. Uh, he was able to invent uh, a, a, a cutter that can cost, ca cut through the cast and not not cut your skin. And that's used in many hospitals and practices still today or a similar version of that. So, so he never, throughout his entire life, stopped creating and stopped innovating. 
And that is also core to the company and to our work with additive manufacturing. That was the, the reason we went after additive manufacturing, is that we could see how innovative we could be with the technology. So Stryker is a global leader in medtech. Um, we're, we're divided, as we said, with the, in the mission statement. It, it, it's uh, between uh, orthopedics, uh, med surge equipment, and neurotechnology and spine. We're, we're pretty well diversified through, throughout those three areas. <clears throat> And we have a depth and specialization of our products within those areas as well. You see some of them on the screen today. Uh, within orthopedics, we very much have f products in the, in the hip space, the knee space. We have a, a, a robotic arm-assisted surgical technology. Uh, we also have some trauma products uh, and foot and ankle products as well. Uh, a lot of people know us from, from our med surge uh, department in the respect that if you've been in a hospital, you've probably been in a striker bed. If it wasn't a striker bed, it was one of our main competitors. Uh, but we like to think you were in a striker bed. Hopefully you got out quickly. Um, and we also, but we also make a lot of operating room or OR equipment uh, from lighting and booms uh, and, to, and stretchers in your ambulances as well. Uh, we also have a, f several products within the neurotechnology area and spine. Uh, our, our cranial maxillofacial division works in the face uh, and we have uh, some stroke products as well. One of the interesting things for, for me as well as Stryker throughout the years has gone is, is not only a life enhancing company, so not only do we make products that enhance people's lives, we also make products that can save people's lives. We are very much focused and dedicated to innovation. A Stryker spends about five to about six percent of its uh, budget on uh, its sales, sorry, on, um, on R&D, uh, which is great to work in a company, and, and, and I'm sure much of that was spent within additive manufacturing. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we, we are very focused and dedicated to, uh, to patents worldwide as well. And of course, we can't forget about the, the company's success. Uh, at the company, you know, how do we measure success? Certainly, there is success in every customer satisfied, and every patient's life improved or saved. And then even within the company, when we can provide inspiring work for our teams and for our, 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 our people. Of course, we also are a business, and so we do measure ourselves financially. Uh, so it's, it's, it's exciting to show this slide as well. So what it's showing is, is since uh, 1979, which is when Stryker went public, uh, we've had continued growth for the past 39 years in sales. So very exciting uh, spot to be for us. Uh, when you look at, if, if you take the time and you listen or read our, our company reports, a lot of what comes in the, in the later years since our launching of Additive Project is, is a call out to additive manufacturing and how we have been able to use it to enhance people's lives. And so with that, I'm gonna go on to the additive manufacturing part of the, of the presentation. So titanium and laser rapid manufacturing process. Laser rapid manufacturing, or LRM, was sort of our internal name uh, for additive manufacturing. Uh, we use a powder bed uh, manufacturing technology uh, to manufacture uh, components in the orthopedic and the neurotechnology or spine space right now. And where it began, so it began in, in 2001, uh, where we began working with a university on some key development. Um, we began the relationship there with a little bit of funding and a little bit of work going on there. And as we grew, and as the team at, at the university grew in understanding what was going on with the technology, uh, we were able to get our first patent in 2002. I'll talk a little bit about this in, in a few slides, but one of the funny things was that when we first started looking at the technology uh, of additive manufacturing, we went to the university and, and we saw things going on that people were trying to make all these fully dense components. And, and we went to them and we said, actually, could, could you just leave the pores in there? Because we actually want it to be porous. So we spent a lot of time looking at the porous technology that could come out of, out of additive. Um, so it, it took several years. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of patience, a few PhD students. Um, who uh, some of them now work at Stryker. Uh, and we, we finally actually acquired our first prototyping equipment. Something to, to, to call out here as well is that while it is, a, we call it a prototype equipment, we were looking at this technology as, a, as manufacturing technology from the get-go. 
certainly parts of Stryker were looking at the technology from a prototyping perspective to, to uh, cut down on time of the design loop process. But from the get-go, our thought process around this technology was to be a, a, a manufacturing technology to make serial components time and time again. The control that it afforded was very exciting to us, and the potential of what it could do was where we were looking. So in 2007, we got our first prototyping equipment. Uh, it was a great, great piece of equipment. We did a lot of work on that, on that thing. Um, and what we found was that it wasn't quite ready for production. And so it took a little bit of time before we could get a system that we found was, was production capable or production ready. Uh, and we got that piece of equipment in, in 2011. And then it, it took us a couple more years to do all the validations, do the material characterizations, uh, and, and put our first product on the market, uh, get it cleared through our regulatory bodies, the FDA first. Um, in 2013, we had our first surgeries of our titanium triathlon tibial base plate. Uh, and then from there, we've launched several products from there, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, I want to say that from from a, an R&D perspective and, and from, to, to manufacturing, from that, that journey from the beginning in R&D all the way into manufacturing, what made it successful, you know, besides the really cool part of the technology and the capability that technology can bring, was the relationships with cross-functionally of different people at different times across the, the, the length and the lifetime of the project. To start in a very R&D setting, to be really, really willing to look at the science and understand the science under, about the technology, and to move further and further, closer and closer, I guess I should say, to the manufacturing side of the technology, you know, keeping, keeping the cross-functional team together. So it is very much about the people as well as the technology. I mentioned patents, so we had our first patent in 2002, and we continued to patent both the technology, the way that we use it, the way we make our porous structures, as well as a lot of the designs that come out of the technology, which is really, truly a very exciting part of the technology. Um, and I would say we have more than 12 today as part of our portfolio. So after we first began uh, making some um, products and we are seeing how it went, uh, the base plate continued to, to actually grow the sales. We launched it in a full launch in 2014. Uh, we saw that it was doing really well. We had some other products uh, out on the market. Uh, Stryker's strategy around additive manufacturing began to grow and mature. And we created a global Imagine Institute, which is a philosophy and, 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 and a design creation. It's a proprietary way in which we create uh, components with additive manufacturing, and it's headquartered in Cork, Ireland, and this is, this is the, uh, the, the, the manufacturing site. We also created this manufacturing site to be dedicated to ad additive manufacturing. Um, we're fully aware that additive manufacturing isn't as mature as some of our other manufacturing technologies, maybe as casting or forging or some of the other ways that we work. So we understand that having a, a site that's focused on it, has the science you know, behind it, as well as manufacturing focus of the technology together. So titanium. Uh, uh, titanium was mentioned before I came out on stage. Um, titanium is why we began looking into additive manufacturing in the first place. Uh, we had a we had a, a, a porous metal uh, technologies. Um, I'll show a few pictures of them here. So we had we had porous metal technologies out in the industry uh, for many years. If you go back in the medical device industry to the 1980s, a lot of components we were starting to coat them with beads. So why would we bother? Why would we, why would we coat these components with beads? That those beads really were supposed to leave some space for the bone to be able to interdigitate in with the implant. Uh, we found that that, that worked. Um, it it uh, didn't have as much porosity as maybe we wanted, so we looked at other ways to make porous metal technology. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was the, the way of the industry. There's some other of our competitors of other ways of making porous metal. And we, we explored a few, um, and you can see the pictures of them in the top in the 2000, uh, 2008, excuse me, pictures. Um, and, the, and they work really well. Um, they're a coating. So they're coatings that have to be applied to implants. Uh, and, and, you know, they usually require some type of high temperature, which can then, you know, it can compromise the mechanical properties of the substrate that you're putting it on, which means that you, you still have high quality and you put out good components, but you limit where you can put 
that porous material. You limit where you can, which types of components you can actually apply that, those coatings to. And so they're also long processes. There's lots of manufacturing steps that go into them. So we were looking for an alternative way to make this tritanium technology. We were looking for an alternative and elegant way in which we could make it simply and accurately each time we made it. And that's where tritanium and additive manufacturing came from. So what's the advantage of, a, of, of an additive porous structure or an additive tritanium? It's many of the same advantages you might see in components that, that aren't porous, is that um, besides the biologic fixation one, that is very, very porous and very, uh, very related to the medical device industry. But one of the things is you can really um, have your design window opened up. So we can tailor the uh, pore size and the porosity of our tritanium to meet our product needs. We can interdigitate that with solid material or, or dense material and not have everything be porous. We can put it in, different, in places that we could, no, we could not have thought about before. All right, so I'm going to take a little bit of time now and talk about some of how we design for additive manufacturing. So why additive? I think I'm sort of preaching to the choir when I say why additive here in a, in a, in a venue like this. Um, but we really wanted to go after, again, those hybrid structures. What do we mean by hybrid structures? The ability to place porous structures or our titanium features along with dense features. We wanted to... Um, uh, for, for example, if you look at the top picture, that's our tritanium uh, tip, triathlon tibial base plate. And we have a, a, a keel on that that provides stability. We have some pegs that provide a different type of stability, and we have pore structure in there for that bone interdigitation. We can place those pegs wherever we want to. We can, we can place the pore structure wherever we want to for the design purposes, for a clinical benefit. Um, another good example of that is it's a, a, our our. PL uh, components that we'll talk about in just a few minutes there as well. Um, we have a, 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 a patella that we make um, that has a uh, porous structure uh, on one side for the bone to interdigitate, and then we have a different engineered structure that receives uh, polyethylene, which articulates against the, the um, the femoral component during, during use. So we can create structures that we really were never able to be created before. The bottom picture is a, is a, it's, it's, it's an augment that is put in in a revision knee a situation where you have a knee implant and you have to remove it. And there's some bone that's been lost. And so if you put in a, uh, a, a revision cone, is what it's called, uh, we can use the porous structure to get the existing bone to really articulate and interdigitate into those features. Um, and we can use additive manufacturing to create different features on the inside of that component that really accurately uh, mate with the, with the uh, knee component that goes in. So designs that we were never able to make before. Okay, something has gone a little bit funny with this uh, slide, you may see. <laughs> What this is showing is that as we did work through, or it's supposed to be showing, as we did work through the technology and we started looking at ways to, be, to, to use it, um, we started using it the way that I think a lot of people began in, in the beginning with their, their journey with additive manufacturing. We can use it for, for rapid prototyping. So it's amazing how quickly to us, this was probably 2010, 2009 when we were looking at this, maybe even slightly earlier. It was amazing to us at the time how many different features we could make in one build and, and really test them. Melanie just talked about being able to have, what is it, 10 or 12 little alloy, you know, different alloys in, in that one disc. That was not available to us before additive manufacturing manufacturing came around. Um, and what this is looking at is different designs for, uh, for the, the, the peg feature on the tibial base plate, and uh, we wanted a certain pull-out strength on that, so, uh, so we were able to really quickly, uh, rapidly uh, iterate the design and choose that quickly. All right, so I'm going to step away from additive manufacturing for a minute, and I'm going to talk about something else we have at Stryker, another technology that we work with that, um, that it was actually homegrown within the company. Um, but it, it really dovetails nicely with additive technology in how we create revolutionary designs to make healthcare better. Um, so that's, sorry, that's uh, SOMA, or Stryker Orthopedics Modeling and Analytics. So before SOMA was invented, how did we know how big or small bones were? 
in the old school way, we had to measure them. So we could use 2D radiographs uh, to get an idea of how big, say, a proximal femur was. Um, or sometimes uh, scientists and engineers would go to uh, library collections or museum collections where they had bone artifacts and they would actually measure them. Um, um, however, with today's more advanced technologies just in general, uh, we can actually use CT scans um, uh, through the medical imaging process and use those to help us design our products. So let's see how that was, is done. <clears throat> So how was SOMA built? So SOMA was built together within Stryker uh, with a collaboration between those on our, our team, our, our joint replacement division and our trauma and extremities division. So those are our, our teams that focus on products for joint replacements and focus on products for traumas and extremities. Um, and they both had a, a unique a need at the time to look at bone size, shape, uh, and, and, and uh, be more accurate in their implant design. And so what they've done is they began to compile a comprehensive library or a database of CT scans. Um, I think it started initially with about 50 or so and has gone up to over several thousand scans at this time. Uh, and then they built and created analytical tools to take those CT scans, segment out the bone, and be able to use all that information to help create implant designs. <clears throat> Here's a little, a little video here that walks us through it. So SOMA contains over 3,500 CT scans today, uh, and over which um, there's 20,000 outer and inner cortical bone segments. They've been extracted from the, uh, from the CT scans, and we do that through segmentation. And that patient data is de-identified, so we don't know any of the patients, but we have all that data from cortical bones. And what we can do is we can average them. So what you first saw the, when the, the hip was wiggling is you're averaging it. And now once you average it, you can go in and you can measure features on those different bones. You can look at the population distribution. And then you can use that population distribution to look at what a best fit of an implant might look like. In this case, it's a trauma plate where you're looking to see what's the, what's the design window around the trauma plate that best fits the, the distribution that we have. So what we used, uh, the way that we've used it, one of the ways we've used it within additive manufacturing, it's moving ahead of me a little bit, is, um, is in the base plate again. So I mentioned the pegs. Uh, in, the, in the slide that uh, looked at uh, pull-out strength of those pegs and the different designs. Well, the pegs actually keep the, the tibial base plate from rotating. So when you implant the tibial base plate, you don't want it to rotate. Uh, so it, it pro provides some initial stability. If it moves too much, you don't get some good bony ingrowth into that porous structure, which we work so hard to apply. Um, and so we could look at uh, the placement of those that would best resist rotational motion during use. But also, you don't want to hit them up against your cortical bone. If you hit it up against the cortical bone in the patient, that's not good for load sharing, and that's not a good, good spot to be in. And so you want to avoid the cortical bone, keep within the cancellous bone, get them out enough so that the, it's not rotating. And so we can look at patient distribution and choose where it's best to place those, uh, place those pegs across all our different size ranges. Um, interesting about this, uh, this, this technology, too, the, the SOMA technology, is if we needed to, we could look at different types of populations. So we could look at uh, females and see do we need a different design for female population. We could look at um, you know, Northern Europeans only. We could look at the Asian population only. We could put everyone together and see can we have a product range that can really meet the entire market worldwide and globally for Striker. So we've used this on other, other products that we've uh, additively manufacturing. So this Trident II Tritanium is one of our most recent uh, launches of, of Trident uh, of, of uh, additive manufactured product, and it's one of the most exciting for us. It's probably the biggest launch of additive manufacturing we've had. Um, so the Trident II Tritanium is a new acetabular shell for us. It has our Tritanium structure on it, and we use SOMA to verify where we would have the screws. But SOMA is not just the story. SOMA helps us with the story of the design. Additive manufacturing then can then add more features that we wouldn't have been able to do before, uh, such as being able to um, uh, make design features around the screw holes that is, 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 uh, allows for those screws to go into the implant even further, uh, which allows for the implant to have a thinner shell. 
These all sound like very small things, but what it does as well is that we can then um, make it, when the shell is thinner, we can make a, either a larger head uh, fit within the, the acetabular shell, um, or we can, we can also use maximize our polyethylene thickness. So the polyethylene is the liner that goes into the shell. So you see it in white up there on the screen. Um, and then inside that shell, there's a, a, a ball head that goes into that to articulate, and the stem is, is in the femur part of the, of, the, um, of the leg. So why is this important? So this is important from a competitive advantage perspective. So if you can get a larger head into that acetabular shell, the patient has a, lar a, a wider or a larger range of motion. That means a patient who's had their hip replaced can move their leg more. And, and, and it feels more like they felt before they had the hip. So it has an advantage, or the, probably more like before they had the pain when they had the hip, but uh, it has an advantage over our customers as well. So this is what we're trying to do with additive manufacturing, really understand our patient needs, understand the customer needs from the, the surgeon need, and then design, put in design features, the titanium structure, the thinner wall, that's going to help make patients better, help make healthcare better. And of course, we have the titanium structure. Our titanium structure is entirely controlled by, by the way we build it. Uh, so it is the same every time we build it. You build a size 54 acetabular shell, one day it's going to be the same titanium structure 10 days from then. Um, but we also have the ability to manipulate it as we want to for the component. I did mention that before. Um, so in, in, we can even do it within the component. So you, you can have functionally graded materials. You could have higher porosity in one place and a more dense material in another, depending on the need. In this particular case, we engineered a surface structure both to have a high coefficient of friction, which allows for a good initial stability of the shell, um, as, as well as increases the surface porosity. So the, what is the surface porosity? The porosity, surface porosity is the, uh, the porosity of the implant as it interfaces with the bone. Uh, so we were able to manipulate that uh, to what was, uh, what was required and needed of the component. Uh, and it really is designed to mimic the characteristics of bone. I have a next slide, should be a, uh, a little video of that for you, of the process for you. So I bet you were wondering when I was going to show a little video of the process. Um, that's a nice animation that shows the general, general parts of the process, but also shows some of the, the structures and, 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 and items that we, we put into the implant to really make, make healthcare better and make it the best shell that is, is made out there. It is, by the way, already our, our highest selling acetabular shell. 
uh, within just a year of launch, so it's pretty exciting for us. So what I've gone through so far really is a little bit of history of additive manufacturing technology for Stryker for our joint replacement space. So we, you know, we had the, the development it came out of our joint replacement R&D teams along with the collaboration with the university, uh, a lot of our prototyping that went on in the early days, a lot of work around you know, material testing, mechanical properties, seeing if we could actually make what we wanted to make. And then the actual production of joints uh, and, and augments that um, for serial production, these are all made in size ranges, the same every day, all the time, each, each shell, each, each tray that goes out there. So we have gone, Stryker, as you saw in the beginning, has a wide range of products. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about going beyond the wide range of products. You can see this slide also didn't quite get. So <laughs> something went funny on this slide as well. Uh, this is supposed to be a PL cage. So uh, it's a spinal cage. It's a, it's a fusion cage. It goes, goes in your back. Um, and it's diffused two, two vertebrae together. Uh, you'll see, actually, I have another video, and I'm glad I'm showing the video. It's a little bit like your acetabular shell video that we just saw, but it's going to show you the device a little bit better uh, than this picture shows you right now. Uh, but what, it, what was really neat, oh, there we go. What was really neat about this is that we were able to um, uh, design in features that we never really designed before using the power, the transformative power of additive manufacturing and building up that component you know, from, from grains of powder, metal powder, into metal components. And so what we have are very specific uh, features that are designed uh, just because of that. So we have um, some teeth on the flat surfaces uh, of the Im implant, and what that, that's, that, that's designed and put interdigitated in with porous structure, the titanium structure. So the teeth are there to keep the implant from coming out after you insert it. Uh, and the porous structure there is maximized to allow for bony interdigitation and biologic fixation. Um, the, the, the windows were made a certain size to be able to also allow for more bone to ingrow, as well as to be able to visualize re in radiographs. So here's the second video. So what I like about that video is in the beginning, um, you know, the, the, the later part of it was a little bit like the, the, the tritanium one for the acetabular shell because they are very similar. It is tritanium. It's our pet. It's our, it's our trademark porous structure. Um, but it showed how, to, how the, the um, solid features and the porous features can really be placed wherever you want them. And they can be placed wherever the patient needs them. And that's important in terms of um, really, again, going back to that making healthcare better. So the, the tritanium story for spine involves a lot of different uh, parts of it, uh, including our Imagine technology um, and including um, some, some on-growth and in-growth structures. Uh, what I wanted to point out on this particular slide is um, all the way on the, I guess it's the right, the second to the right and the right, you see uh, uh, animal studies and some x-rays. Uh, so so the, the second to the to the end is a picture uh, from a histology slide out of an animal study that was done with the PL cage uh, to look at could we actually get fusion with tritanium and with these, with these applications. So this was new to the spine market at the time. 
Um, and if, if, you, if I had the slide that showed you the comparison of other technologies like Peak and some of the other uh, standard of care at the time, um, you wouldn't see that fully pink bony ingrowth all the way through the cage. And in, in this case, you do. And that's very exciting for the, for the spine market. Um, as well, in the, in, the, in the radiograph, you can see that you can see the component, but you can see between it, you can see uh, some, of the, some of the imaging just makes it easier than a, a big a piece of metal uh, that's just in, in the spine or the, the polymer, the peak cages as well. It's very hard to see them. And so it has some advantages from that. And interestingly, uh, one of the slides I didn't show about the company is that we, we do acquire uh, a different, different companies uh, at, at a pretty good pace. Uh, one of our acquisitions um, at the end of last year was K2M, which was a, a, a spine competitor at the time. And now we are stronger together. Uh, and they also had found the power of additive manufacturing in their, their fusion devices in a, in, a, in a slightly different way. And so they, had, they focused on slightly different uh, areas within the spine, uh, but looking to solve similar problems. And they solved it in, a, in an elegant and a different way, where they looked to uh, create uh, pores and holes in the sides of the component, uh, leaving very large space in the center for that bone and growth, as well as to put allograph in there. Uh, and, then, and then they also looked at the surface of the titanium to make sure that there was good on growth of, of the bone from, from the implant there. And if you look at that, if you look at the picture in the middle in particular, uh, what I was talking about in that imaging, uh, they, they have super imaging in, in, the, in the radiographs or the x-rays that come out uh, after, after implantation to be able to see the device and to be able to see what's going on inside uh, that cage as the bone grows and infuses and relieves the pain for the patient. And so together, actually between Stryker and K2M, who are now Stryker Spine, uh, we have the largest portfolio of 3D printed cages uh, on the market. So we're, we're, we're very excited about that and what the future, future comes from that. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about today is that jump into patient-specific, which for Stryker, again, we started as a serial production manufacturer with additive manufacturing. It wasn't in our, um, our first you know, five products to go patient-specific. Uh, but I'm pleased to be able to say that in April, we did launch a, 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 it's a limited launch, but we did begin a surgeries of a new patient-specific device in the CMS, CMF space. Uh, so in, in this case, uh, the, page, the, the surgeon actually works with uh, designers within the company uh, to appropriately design plates uh, for orthognatic or mid-face reconstruction <clears throat> uh, and design uh, components, design these plates uh, to correct either, either there's been, a, there could be a tumor or there could be some, some um, ed something that they want to correct uh, to, to help with, with breathing or other different medical uh, reasons. Uh, so we're really excited about this new product, and it is our first uh, patient-specific technology. One of, the, one, of the, one of the exciting things for us as well is that we actually were able to take the same manufacturing technology that we use for serial production and move it into the patient-specific space, really putting us in a, in a good spot for, for more patient-specific devices in the future. And so with that, that is our journey. You know, we began in 2001 as a, a, a little bit of seed money to a university uh, to solve a problem that we were trying to solve. And uh, today, we have all these devices on the market, and we expect that there will, be, uh, there will be more to come. So we're very excited about additive manufacturing technology. I think just in general, the, the industry has just uh, just scratch the surface. And I love conferences like this to come to to see where we will go next with the technology.